MI Cynic, the podcast with a license to inform. This is your host, Thomas Brancato. Today, I have the honor of introducing Mr. Matthew Shaw, fellow at the Global Counterterrorism Institute and doctoral candidate at the University of St. Mark and St. John. In both cases, pursuing novel research on the incel, involuntary celibate subculture. His previous education includes degrees in social policy and criminology, both at the University of St. Mark and St. John. Thank you so much for joining us today. Welcome. Thank you for the opportunity. Tell us a little bit about your education and your work. I believe you said that uh, you're from Plymouth originally. Well, I originally come from a naval family and was born up in Scotland and moved down to Plymouth um, to be by the dockyard for my early years up to about five or six years old. Then I moved back up to Scotland and spent up to my mid-twenties in and around Glasgow. I did my formative growing up there and everything like that. I moved back down with uh, my wife and kids at the time to Plymouth just to get better opportunities with the schools. Um, and that sort of inspired me to look for a way out of way out of um, Plymouth, really. And at the time of the Yazizi mountain attack by ISIS was covering the news quite a lot. And it, for some strange reason, it really caught my attention that the same happened on September 11th. I was actually on a flight to Amsterdam at the time. So it'd been something that I'd been sort of looking at terrorism and extremism just sort of casually for, for 10 years or so. Um, when I started at university, I actually did my bachelor's degree in criminology, where I looked predominantly at Islamic extremism. And then I moved on to social policy for my master's, where I looked at Islamic extremism as well. Um, but looking for some of the subjects from other modules, I started to touch upon things such as the underreporting of intimate partner violence against males, which is something that I had experience in in my previous workplaces in drug and alcohol outreach. So it's sort of come a little bit full circle. I've gone back to what I was doing at work, but now on a more sort of academic and educational level. I find that really interesting because the lumping together, if you will, of, of terrorism, radicalization, and incel perhaps is, to me anyway, a more modern uh, understanding or, or take on it. I can imagine in my life, you know, that 20 years ago, uh, incel was not really a word that at least I, I would have heard and perhaps uh, would have been part of the mainstream. And so it's interesting how now that's sort of being studied together with terrorism and radicalization. We'll be getting there in a moment about what links those might have and why we do tend to study these, uh, these topics side by side. But for the moment, Matthew, I want to just turn our attention to a news story, perhaps the, the most one of the most recent ones that we've had uh, here in the UK uh, regarding the incel phenomenon. And of course, I'm talking about something that uh, happened in your hometown in Plymouth a few months ago on the 12th of August. And well, this was one of the largest mass shootings committed in the UK. It was committed by Jake Davidson, of Plymouth, who was uh, linked to the Insel movement. So this is the university that you studied as well in Plymouth. And so, and of course, it's a subject that you study. So I'm, I'm kind of wondering when that the news broke out, how did this impact you personally? Uh, did it kind of strike close to home? When the news broke, um, I was actually driving past the incident um, as it happened. It was, it was very close to one of the main thoroughfares at sort of rush hour traffic in the city. And I sort of got home and went straight on to my LinkedIn, all the general news sources and everything like that. I was also getting the social media side of it through just my social connections. I know people that live in the area. I know people that work in the places that he worked. I myself worked in a boat building factory that works alongside staff from where he worked. Um, so it wasn't something that sort of surprised me in terms of the atmosphere that exists amongst those workplaces. There is still a sort of aspect of old school sort of misogynistic male young men's clubs sometimes. Um, but in terms of my experiences within the university, it wasn't something that was obvious to me, which was quite strange because um, Marge on the university that I went to, there's a sports-based university. So things in terms of things that incels talk about, the chads and the jocks and everything, that sort of side of their ideology, 
uh, they're very present, but there was never sort of any animosity. It wasn't something that I came across. And in my own, amongst my own co cohort in both of my courses at the university, I was predominantly one of two men in the course that was 90% female. So it wasn't something that I sort of came across, what I did come across more so was the, the uh, I guess, looking at that those types of discussions, dating during student life and everything, but from a female perspective, because that's where all my friends were at the time. So it, it sort of gave me an understanding from the other side. I can see um, some of Jake Davidson's problems, but I can see some of the reasons why we, society, and especially around Plymouth, can contribute to that. And here the large disclaimer is that the incel phenomenon is not something I am uh, a proficient uh, specialist in by any means. Uh, you know, I'm learning as we go along here. But I believe that's useful in its own way. And the information I get is from the news more than anything. Well, I think what struck me, and perhaps this, this resonates with you as well, Matthew, is Toxic masculinity is a word that that I'm hearing a lot more often. I think this is part of the debates that we're having now as a society. It's uh, what is the role, of, what is the place of masculinity within society? Is there a problem with groups of young men? And the incel movement is often thrown in there, and we're debating that as well. But what struck me during this this heinous, horrific event was the giant leap that at least in my mind between having that conversation about toxic masculinity and a mass shooting which seems like a very extreme action to take and so i think this perhaps awakened many people about you know it's not necessarily a harmless movement it's not you know there's a real danger and to what we're discussing and this is the the logical result if you will of the unchecked uh, incel sort of paranoia or whatever we'll be getting that in in a second but i think the, the point that i want to raise that for me when the news broke out it was a big unexpected shock and i can imagine it for you as well uh, you know growing up and studying and living in plymouth as you do all of a sudden these aren't things that we read on a page. Go so far as to say it's something that I wouldn't have expected to happen in Plymouth. I had spoken to my partner and at the university to lecturers about it being a problem. And I think that, that Plymouth is provides almost a breeding ground because opportunities for young people across the board are very limited. There's very little investment into social structures or youth clubs or anything like that. So there, there is that sort of breeding ground for that in here. It's a very male populated city. There's a Navy base here, there's multiple dockyards, there's an army base here. So there is a lot of that, I guess, testosterone fueled masculine job roles in and around the city as well. And that I think can feed in and it just helps. And this is something that I want to return to as well is what exactly is the relationship between masculinity, traditional, toxic, whatever suffix or uh, prefix you want to add on to it, masculinity or men specifically, and uh, the breeding ground, as you say, for the insulin, what that relationship is. But I want to take a step back, Matthew, uh, because I, I'm actually, um, I'm interested as well in, in your uh, sort of the direction that your academic life and professional life has taken to lead you into study in cells. Um, because your earlier work, correct me if I'm wrong, had to do with, you looked at, as you said, Islamic extremism. And I believe you've done work as well on rehabilitating Syrian children. So I'm interested in how you went from those aspects into the insult movement. Was there a specific event like the Plymouth shootings or did this happen before? The decision to move into a more incel focused uh, mode of study, I guess, came from a discussion with a lecturer that I was having in relation to my thesis looking at rehabilitations for Syrian children. And I came up with a conversation about feminism and I discussed about it needing a reframing because some there's arguments within the media that some people would argue that feminism has gone too far. And I raised the point of, we talk about men's rights activists, they form part of the manosphere, the incel discourse. Um, and they've been cast as violent, misogynistic, and that sort of it has been left at that. Um, I sort of got a little bit belittled by the member of staff, and that just sort of ignited a 
fuel in me then to sort of go, no, this is something that does need to be looked at. I myself was the victim of an abusive relationship. Um, so it was something that I sort of buried. And then when I started to research it again, it sort of became a bit more bubbled to the surface. And I think doing the internship with the Global Counterterrorism Institute, I found that, again, a lot of my cohort, a lot of it was based on the more religious aspects and political aspects of terrorism. And I think according to the definition, you need the political aspects. But I think there's a, a sociological, extreme, uh, social-based extremism is something that we really need to start looking at now. And I think the, the act of terrorism is to cause terror. Does it need to have that political underlying undercurrent. I very much agree with you that I think the incel movement, it touches on a lot of other movements in society. It's not an isolated vacuum. And this is one of the reasons why I want to speak about it on, on this podcast, because if anybody out there is wondering, well, you know, why are you talking about the incel movement on, on a security and intelligence podcast? Well, it's because before in my other previous podcasts I spoke on this channel about terrorism and specifically about the rise of ultranationalist or so-called uh, white terrorism in Norway. And uh, there's many other examples as well. Perhaps this is on, on the rise, extreme far-right terrorism. And I think there might be a, a link there to be made with the insult movement and where this might lead. Having said that, going back to the Plymouth shootings, this event, for me, shares similarity to the Isla Vista killings. These were committed by Elliot Roger in, uh, in the United States, who was self-declared part of the insult movement. The resemblance there is uncanny and worrying. And this, you know, this is more of the reason, perhaps, why I feel this is such an important topic to be discussing and to be researching and to be taking seriously and not treating as a separate, isolated, let's say, purely social or cultural concern. This has serious ramifications for security and safety in society as well. Well, the question that I have when we put these two shootings side by side, I'm wondering if the UK as well is heading towards a greater number of uh, insult motivated attacks, uh, like the ones that we've seen in the US. What, what's your opinion on that, Matthew? I personally struggle a little bit with the, with the labeling of the Jake Davidson case. Um, having looked at his internet output, whilst there is reference to incel subreddits and incel content on his YouTube, there's also a lot of discussion that he had on incel exit. So he was looking to, to leave and he'd realized that the, there was a negative aspect of this feeding his negative self image, I guess. And there, there are other factors at play that the police investigation hasn't been handled very well. There was failings by the police, whereas in he'd actually had his weapon taken away from him following a previous assault and it had been given back to him. And I, I myself actually, the day after, so what would have been the Friday after the attack, took what I had compiled from my own research that evening into the police station, made a statement and told them to contact me if they, if they wanted any further information. I never received anything. And now two months later with the inquest still happening, I've wrote specifically again to the lead investigator offering just a conversation to sort of say, this is what I'm doing. Cause I looked, to, I'm looking to do this in my PhD next year. So I think the Jake Davidson case is a bit of a, a weird a weird one to sort of hold aside, but there have been cases, other incel related cases in, in Britain before, they just not received as much media attention. Um, ben Mahanian is, is one from Portsmouth where he stabbed three women um, over three separate occasions. And he again spoke of the misogynistic values that you see within the incel rhetoric and output. So I think there is a problem here. And I think in every other aspect of socialization, Britain tends to follow America. And I think having children myself that are 17, 13, 8, and 6, you can see that the, stress, the stresses and pressures that they face over here are exactly the same. So I don't see any reason why we should be thinking that it isn't going to be an issue for, for, for British people, for British society. 
No, absolutely not. I agree that uh, trends that happen in the United States have a habit of we follow them behind sometimes. I mean, not in all cases, but in some we do. And it's worrying that we've seen cases in the United States of insult motivated attacks. And now, as you say, this this has been happening here as well. And of course, the the natural worry, but also the, the job of people that look into security is to say, okay, you know, what is this? Is this a threat? And, uh, you know, how do we stop this? That is my overriding concern with the Jake Davidson case itself is that the coverage that it received, um, both in the media and within academia, there was um, a wealth of studies and research that came out. And I think some of it, it could be questioned. And I think raising the attention to the movement the way that we have done and not explained it properly, that only furthers the risk of an incident happening again. We've drawn attention to it, but we haven't discussed the problem. No, not at all. And that's why I think the work you're doing, Matthew, is, is so important. And uh, hopefully a podcast like mine today is, is raising awareness. I think a part of the problem is awareness. Part of the problem is that we, as a society, don't really know how to deal with this. There's so much of this also wrapped up within the other conversations happening about toxic masculinity, feminism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That it, for me, anyway, it gets really difficult to kind of be able to define something, to be able to understand something and not be swept away by the ideology of the left or right wing or whatever it is telling you how to frame a discussion and which lens you use. For me, though, when there's blood spilled and when there's violence committed, it merits and it warrants our attention and especially uncomfortable as it might be to be able to view this from every different angle and to try and cr crack down on what the problem exactly, where it might be rooted. And this is where I want to get into at this part of the conversation as well. It's, you know, let's crack open this insult and movement and let's see what's inside, you know, what we can get from sociology and from research and from other different branches of knowledge. One of the papers that I thought was really interesting had to do with Speckard and Ellenberg, Dr. Anne Speckard, uh, director of the International Center of Study in Violent Extremism. The claim that these researchers made was, or suggested, was at least that some of these insult men may themselves suffer from mental health problems. This was in a, in a study done in 2021. This, for me, immediately raises a, a fresh set of questions. And again, this, this has to do with challenging ourselves to, to be able to understand what the incel movement is from different angles. And th that's why I think this, this quote that I'm giving you from, from Speckard and Ellenberg is so important because it challenges us to be able to not do the immediate casting of the incel of, uh, you know, backwards, angry, white, working class, young men from out of London and, you know, just put them in a little box and don't worry about it. There's nothing you can do. I think that kind of mentality is not helpful. Helpful, and it doesn't really answer the, any of the questions raised. And if we can't question them honestly and get honest answers, then we have no hope of, of being able to stem the tide, so to speak. But I digress. My question regarding specifically to Speckard and Allenberg is, is it possible that self-identified insult young man can be both at the same time? Somebody that suffers from mental, mental health problems but also be somebody that we can hold criminally and fully liable for the responsibility of their actions. What's your take on that? I think it's crucial that we can see the mental health aspect of the ideology um, just from looking at the self-image of those who identify as incel, they often feel as though they've been rejected by society. There, there are numerous studies um, saying things about ADHD is one many in cells sort of self-diagnose with, and that's the problem with some of the statistics. Having read the Speckard and Ellenberg one, that, that study isn't, that's a, that's a factual based study. But there are other studies that have evaluated the manosphere and run studies on subreddits such as our in cell. Um, I think it is something that we do need to look at. We have a uh, Rhetoric in Britain about mental health where we need to talk about it and we've had that for the last sort of 10 years. I think what we're seeing now is a case of 
where's the action that follows the talk? Um, there is only a certain amount of things that that you can achieve. There needs to be some some sort of progress. And if you don't relate that to how somebody is living their life, then you're almost banging your head against a brick wall. Um, and within the, 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 the communication spaces of the incel movement, there's almost a, a celebration of poor mental health, depression and poor self-worth, everything like that, because it feeds into their narrative of, yes, I, I am left behind. So it's something that we need to talk about. I think there's the newsworthiness of the incel and its relationship to sex is the tip of the iceberg. And I think not acknowledging mental health as part of the discussion about that is going to do a disservice to our future research and any rehabilitation work that we do in the future. I completely agree with you. I think as you were saying that, I was also thinking that part of the problem might stem from the fact that when we're looking at strong emotions uh, like rejection and strong responses to that, such as misogyny and in the worst of cases, mass violence and uh, shootings, uh, we're talking about a certain weight of this problem, a certain kind of difficulty in any solutions that we might put forward. This is not a quick fix. This is not an easy solution. And I think one of the problems that the news media might have with that is that because of the speed that you get bulletins and news coming forth and the, this happened in that part of the world and there's always a new drama and a new chaos. But when we're talking about these difficult set of problems, they don't have an easy answer. I think that represents half of the problem within understanding the incel ideology. It does make society raise questions about itself. Um, and I think that's something that we might get onto later. Yes, definitely. It holds a mirror to a lot of the problems that we have as a society in regards to youth, in regards to masculinity, in regards to violence and many other things. And uh, we will definitely get be getting to that as well. All right. Well, let me throw a, another one at you, Matthew. ONS statistics prove that outside of gender-related violence, men experience violence at a far more significant rate, according to Elkin 2019. This is also applicable to statistics pertaining to, to suicide and self-harm. So this, and this is from ONS statistics, which is as verified as statistics gets. But here, to me, that's highlighting that men are also experiencing violence at a significant rate. And putting that side by side with our discussion just now on mainstream media and how this debate is framed and how this problem is presented, do you think there's a correlation there as well about certain issues being glossed over, not being talked about, not being understood, being taken for granted, and, and not being properly divulged? Is there a case of media silence, and specifically in regards to male suicide and self-harm? And do you think that silence in any way relates back to what we're seeing with the insult movement and the actions that it's, some of its members are taking? Absolutely. I think the media framing is critical. We don't tend to hear about men's mental health or anything in the news. Um, and I think what we need to get away from it is applying gender to violence. We need to start accepting as a society that violence happens to everyone, whether it be male or female, female or male, male or male, female or no. Um, what, what you do tend to find, though, is when you raise points about men's issues, they tend to come up in discussions about violence on females because there isn't a space for men to have those conversations. What tends to happen is that they then get shut down. We're, you're only talking about this because um, you want to make yourself feel better. And we've seen um, academics such as Jordan Peterson and Warren Farrell, who were very much behind the feminist movement, now talking up from um, speaking up for men's issues, and they now face crucifixion on their online podcasts and YouTube because they're not espousing the the. the the feminist framing of the media where domestic violence is almost exclusively an action that happens to women. Domestic violence is always physical and that's not always the case at all. There are plenty of men who suffer from manipulation in a relationship. And if they don't have a space to get these issues out, then they will turn to 
areas of the internet where they they get support which again i guess relates back to where we were talking about the mental health issues if they feel like they've completed the talking process with recognized um, practitioners psychologists etc and they find a space where their views are getting backed up and they're getting support for some people it could be the first time that they experience this that's a very very powerful thing especially when you feel that your issues aren't getting reflected in the mainstream. Um, the Mankind Initiative ran an advert a few years ago and it depicted male on female um, argument in a park and people were there threatening to call the police and when they flicked the situation around, people were laughing. And I think that's a problem that we really need to start addressing in society. We need to break away the, the, the gender aspect of violence and start accepting violence for what it is. It affects everybody. Certainly. Uh, absolutely. Well, the, there's, there's so much to go off on there, Matthew. But one, one of the things that is strikes me immediately is when we talk about that silence and we talk about the, the void that is created or for lack of a better word, a void that is left behind by not discussing certain things or discussing uh, certain topics under only one kind of uh, cleansed, uh, politically correct or whatever it is, party line, a void is created. And unfortunately, that void for, as you say, many young men leads them to seek support, which actually only ends up twisting things further and corrupting and, and leading to these kind of violent outcomes. Now, I'm not the person, and, and this podcast is, of course, not the place to be casting aspersions on any one kind of a ideology or discussing the finer points of uh, feminism. It's, it's, of course, outside of my area of, of expertise. The focus that, that I have and that MI Cynic has, security focus. But I think to be able to answer that question, it's not about where we stand on an ideological level, but it certainly has a lot to do with being very clear and precise about what we're looking at. To do that, unfortunately, we have to sometimes be able and willing to, to discuss which factors are making a problem worse, are making people more likely in this case to lash out in violent negative emotions. And I think you're absolutely right as far as I can see that the current media environment is actually pulling perhaps young people into further problem instead of dragging them out. And I think this is a discussion that we need to have, but where it gets very complicated is, as you say, it gets very difficult to talk about incel members as potential victims of, of this t twisting of, of narratives and twisting of reality and lashing out of, it, of emotions. When we're also being asked, of course, to principally see them as perpetrators of violence and representatives of misogyny and figureheads of, let's say, all everything wrong with masculinity. And I think this is where it gets really, really difficult. How can you help if you, you're being asked to take a stand to be judgmental? What do you make of that, Matthew? Do you think that perhaps in placing so much attention to them as perpetrators, we're losing focus of being able to actually help, uh, especially the younger men who might be in danger of uh, stepping into incel uh, mindset. So I think we I think we need to talk about it more. And I think in terms of get young people, um, the proliferation of social media and the ability of extremist groups or extreme rhetoric to sort of, for want of a better word, infiltrate many platforms. It can be roadblocks, Discord. When we're being asked as a society to be to look, we're looking at this problem, we're looking at the shootings happening, we're looking at other forms of violence manifesting themselves, but we're being asked to view them as a perpetrator. And it makes sense, you know, to an extent is, you know, when somebody commits a heinous act, immediately you would hold them responsible. I think where it gets complicated with the insult movement is that a lot of the people, a lot of the young men specifically that are being pushed to the fringes are being pushed because of another factor. We say, no, no, these are representatives of an evil, fascist, sinful, toxic masculinity. There's nothing we can do to help them. We have to start at the very top of the system, tear down the patriarchy, and then maybe we can get around to helping these people. And correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me there's, there's many inherent flaws with looking at it that way, as all systemic uh, and never talking about the individual. 
I think breaking down the stereotype that's been attributed to incel is crucial. Um, the, the imagery that they use is so violent, but when you consider those who sort of make up most of its subscribers, they've been raised on a diet of Grand Theft Auto, Call of Duty, and that violence in the media in terms of film and everything as well. So it's, it's, it's not really, it shouldn't come as a surprise that they sort of start making those connections as, as a way to, to, to be heard, to make a stance. I've got an issue and I'm not being listened to. Well, I've seen throughout history, like if people do this, then something will happen. And maybe us sort of subs subscribing to the image that they put out of this toxic masculinity, you do forget that actually within the subculture, there is a lot of hurt in there. These people are hurting. And it's very hard to see vulnerability within a monster. I think this speaks to the heart of the problem, Matthew, because where does the story start? The story starts with young men for different reasons, feeling as if they're being pushed into the fringe. And, you know, it doesn't help at all that being male because of male biology, testosterone, whatever you might call it, because of centuries of history of this stereotype of men or whatever it is that leads them to not talk about their feelings and seek solidarity with other father figures. You know, it might be a complex mix of factors there that young men are being pushed. They lash out when they don't receive support, when they don't receive a positive way forward, they lash out. And, you know, that lashing out can be frightening, can be scary, can be dangerous, can be violent, can be a lot of things. And when it hits the news media, the judgment, the focus is on the lashing rather than pull factors that led these young men to, to lash out in the first place. And I think that's the, there's a tragic cycle here that we're all getting it wrong. The young men not seeking support in the right places to begin with, not seeking positive ways out of their predicament, society that pushes them in the first place. And then the strong news media cycle that judges the lashing instead of being able to dive into the deeper questions of, okay, where did this cycle start? Let's have that debate. So it seems that all the heads are clashing <laughs> and there's no conversation taking place. It's interesting to think of it as, as a start point because of academia sort of has agreed upon the Alana X Bob in 1997 being the starting point of the incel ideology. But in my opinion, there's you can see aspects of their ideology in incidents of mass violence before that. For example, Mark Rapine in Montreal Polytechnic College, um, the Columbine shooting, there are aspects of being left behind by society, of being bullied, a fascination with guns present in, in that case as well. And then you look at what was happening in terms of the, the cultural things. Woodstock 99 was an absolute misogynistic fest. You had the girls gone wild on TV. You had pickup artists shows on VH1. And you look now and... There, there were signs that we were heading this way 20 years ago and we never acknowledged it. And I think that has brought us to where we are now. I think it's really interesting that there's a start date to, yeah. to be in. I mean, to me, it seems that a lot of the, the root problems of the involuntary celibacy is it's not necessarily anything new. The problems that masculinity and, and humanity has had struggled with for untold eons, you know, but now we're calling, now there's an incel movement and everything that's associated with that as well. And I'm actually wondering, you know, is, is that helpful? Is, is it a helpful way of framing this as, oh, that was an incel attack and that is an incel individual and that is the incel hangout and the incel flag? I mean, it, are, are these really helpful or do they actually stop the deeper conversation taking place about, okay, you know, what is the problem at the heart of masculinity that leads to violence? We're going to label any time that a male turns to violence as an incel attack, then we run the risk of labeling theory. And if we keep telling everybody that they are violent misogynists, then there's plenty of theories to suggest that that's what people will be. If we keep alienating people and saying that if, and if anybody was to talk about uh, lack of representation in the media for men and then get called a misogynist repetitively, all that is going to do is, is feed them, not understanding it and taking the aspect, the shocking aspect to give it a face 
isn't really helping because it's being painted as a monster and it's a nasty, horrible ideology, but there are very humanistic elements that are drivers. And as we said, the pull factors towards it as well. And I think labeling the incel as a monster prohibits people from understanding the human aspect of it. Um, I've seen from posts in local news um, relating to the Jake Davidson case that the, the frequency of the word incel is two, three, four hundred times more than what it was six months ago. And it's it's people that I'm not sure understand it. It can be 10-year-olds, 13-year-olds, 50-year-olds, 60-year-olds. I, as a 40-year-old man who studied it now for nearly two years, still fail to understand exactly what it is. Um, there's so many different facets to it. So to just focus and say it's an incel attack, he's driven by violence, it's a response to just the, the toxic masculinity, you're never going to address the problem. All you're going to do is, is make it worse. Now, I think that's really interesting, Matthew, on, on for a number of reasons. One of them is, of course, the fact that, as you say, the quick and easy labelling of things that it creates sound bites that perhaps fit in a Twitter 140 character limit yeah. or, or whatever it is, but they don't really help us understand that all of the, the complex factors at play. For what it's worth, and from my perspective, I think that the more I discuss this with you, the more I realise that there is, there's a dual element to this of, of, you know, on the one hand, the core of the incel movement uh, or, or just of people, this young man, whatever you want to call it, uh, at the core, there's something ancient, the yeah. predisposition to violence, the the, the not being able to stare at your problem, at being honest with yourself or understand the feelings that are happening and the recourse to lash out in strong emotions. Uh, I think that is ancient. It's not, not something new and it's certainly not something that our generation has is the only one to have had to deal with. Yeah. I mean, you know, our grandparents had World War II and uh, so th there's always, in every generation, I think this has been a problem. It's strange that you talk about generational incidents like that. For example, the World War, I think, for the generation slightly below ours, that, that what is happening on social media in terms of the bullying and the abuse, it almost is. It's like a virtual warfare. Well, and that's the new, I think that's that's where the new element comes in. That's where the, yeah. the second part of the, the, of the insole movement, that, that's when it becomes a movement. When you, when you throw in the social media and over the last 20 years that that's been uh, available or 15 or whatever it is. And, and that's when, you know, the, uh, I don't know if we can call it an ideology, but certainly a, a kind of movement is spawning with a, their own memes and jokes and, and their own belief systems and structures. And, uh, you know, among them, I would add nihilism. Yeah. And despair and their fixation with intrinsic factors outside of their control, uh, the blaming of, of women, um, for example, or, or how they see their, their height or their other facial uh, features or, or physical features as, as the root of the, of the problems that they're not able to, well, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And when you throw that together, a sort of pseudo-scientific conspiracy theory is born and it appeals uh, to millions or thousands or however many it is of, of these young men. Um, but I'm wondering, these factors that predispose themselves to resort or justify violence, is it the belief structure that guides them towards these lashing outs? Or is it necessarily that they view an unjust world that they feel they have to correct through violence? I mean, how do you draw those divisions? I would have to totally agree with you on your second point as a response to what they view as an unjust world. Um, I think that we are seeing women are very successful in the 21st century, a lot more successful than what they have done, and that's gender equality, doing a really, really good job. Um, but you can see for the people that make up and subscribe to this ideology or subculture that they feel that th this advancement in, in the liberation of women, for example, um, things such as um, female selectivity on Tinder, if you're not over six foot, don't swipe right, et cetera, et cetera, if you don't earn a six-figure salary. And it's like, we talk about them in the public, it's just trivial little things, but if that is 
if that is your life and you see that every day, those character that I guess the using violence as a response to those characteristics, it, it, it's almost a logical progression. Right. The logical progression that, that leads, as you say, from the tiny things that seem insignificant yeah. at first, the sort of a a collection of all of these perceived injustices. We would talk about some of their issues and for one of a better expression, it would be water off of the duck's back. Um, but if you're continuously getting told that you, you need to be six foot, you need to have a six figure salary, you already feel like you're being left behind. You've tried your best, you've, you've done your school, you've got a job and you're still not getting anywhere. And there's still these obstacles getting put in your place. There comes a point where it is like just the turning to violence to get noticed, I imagine, is, is the primary driver. Yeah, so this is interesting because in, in at least one of the factors that you've mentioned, it isn't simply, as far as I can tell, women doing this to men, but it might also very much be the case that men do this to men. I mean, men are really? ultra competitive. And so, you know, the insult movement is, is of course, a framed in the mass uh, media the, as very specifically, you know, the stereotypical misogynist, lonely, young, white working class. We have that image, but I'm wondering, Matthew, because a lot of these sound like the injustice in a man's world, so to speak, that can be a lot more of a cruel and horrible place. Yeah. Because, you know, it might just be the case, and uh, we'll have to get Jordan Peterson in here, that women mm -hmm. are in uh, much more predisposed to mercy and compassion as yeah. an evolutionary sort of principle there, of course, because if, if you're going to have a child, you need to care for it because it's a year of <laughs> constant yeah. work. I think my sister could attest to, yeah. to how much that is. But anyway, the point I'm trying to make is if women are indeed statistically speaking, have more characteristics of mercy and compassion and altruism, whatever you want to call it, a lot more than men, then wouldn't it stand to reason as well to say a lot of the complaints that the incel movement has towards the, the modern world are, uh, actually stems from the fact that it's more the case of men doing this? I would have to say, I think this is one of the things that we do get wrong a little bit about the incel subculture is there is the same amount of bile um, projected towards males as well. The archetypal, traditional, handsome male with the six pack and all that sort of thing, they are held in the same esteem as women within this space. They are the, 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 the blame, they are the root of the problem. Um, so, and I think that's a failing of our labeling in society, I guess, to sort of say, well, actually, it's, it only consists of misogynistic men that hate women, because that's, that's not true. There is an aspect of hatred there as well. Um, towards men, and there is sympathy within their space for, for far-right extremism, Islamist extremism as well. And they are not ideologies that are driven by gender. Um, and I think this is a half of the problem with the media framing that we've got at the moment is that the fact is we have said that incel as a subculture or as a, a form of violence, it's misogynistic and it's based against women. That is not specifically true because when you look at the statistics and the victims, the majority of the victims in these attacks looking over the last five to six years, they are predominantly male. For me, this is really fascinating. I mean, some of the things that we've been discussing today, the figures of male suicide, self-harm, but as well as you say, the fact that in the incel movement, it's known to those that look into it, that a lot of the hate and uh, strong negative emotions and, and even violence is directed at men as well. And I completely agree with you. I mean, I'll use myself as an example. Before coming into the conversation with you today, Matthew, if somebody were to bump into me and ask me, what is the insult? What's the first thing that comes to mind when you think of insult? I would have completely agreed with you. I would have said it is a case of misogyny driven by complete ignorance and backwardness. And now discussing this with you a little bit, I understand how much more complicated this is and how it, it's it, there's a strong element of misogyny in there, but it's more than that. It's an injustice towards the world. It's the left behind. And um, it plays on a lot of different things between youth and nihilism and, uh, and many other aspects of, of modern life. And fundamentally, I think all of these things are, as you said before, holding up a mirror to what, as a society, is happening, taking place, and the product of that.
And it's interesting how instead of being able to have that discussion on everything from mental health to the economic impacts to, uh, you know, the divides in society that are that are shaping the sin soul movement, we just focus on the lashing out and the misogyny, because those are easier sound bites. Those are that's an easier story to sell, so to speak, than you know, society is is tearing itself apart to the point that we have scores of of young men that are uh, just waiting for the to pull the trigger. That's a harder one to sell. <laughs> and it's not uncommon to meet men that do you feel like they're getting a rough end of the stick? But in my personal experience, none of them are advocating a turn to violence, and I think. We're almost verging on a point where I know that the Police Scotland recent campaign of the the Don't Be That Guy campaign, well, me as a researcher looking at something like this and being told by the Scottish police, don't be that guy, it's like, well, don't label me as a male as as this, because that just feeds back into exactly what we were saying about labelling two minutes ago. So much of this debate and so much of what we understand as a society, as a country about the insul movement is actually shaped by an even stronger ideological lens on, on our side, which just wants to put them in a little box, cast them away as pathetic, backwards, misogynistic people out there and away with it. And it's, it's funny in a dark sense, it's horrible that I think that might actually be fueling more of the insul movement. The fact that we can't even take their concerns legitimately or seriously. Yeah. We're seeing a rise in various extremisms, especially post-lockdown and post-COVID, the Capitol Hill. We see in society that the various forms of extremism are increasing and we are increasing our awareness of them. But what we are not talking about is what is it that is turning Joe Bloggs public onto these extremist extremisms. What is it society that is doing it? It's driving people to go, actually, I want to look at this. This is, I agree with this. Well, how have we let them get into that position? I think that's the conversation that, that, that that's where we need to move the narrative to. Absolutely. And I think for me, immediately, as a, as a sort of devil's advocate counter argument to what you're saying is that even with perfect understanding, even with the perfect truth at our disposal, I think there, there is a limit to how much we can, say, eradicate violence. And I think this is where it gets complicated. And, and, it, and for me, it's not simply an, an issue of uh, you know, males being more predisposed to violence than females. So I do think there might be a biological or psychological argument to be made there. But even if that was not the case, even if we have complete gender equality, even then, I think the problem is at the very root of humanity. If you look at the last however many thousands of millions of years uh, since the first Homo erectus was on the planet, violence has been a constant, much more than peace and civility. If anything, us having this conversation, <laughs> and as we're having Matthew, is the outlier. The common thing would have been um, competition and violence. And so this is where it gets complicated as well, because there's an understandable fear and there's an understandable desire when we these horrible reports of mass violence or even small violence happen, whether it be insult or whether it be terrorist or whether it be whatever it is. The natural human instinct when, when something horrible like that on the news comes out is, firstly, even if we don't quite voice it, thank God I wasn't there that day. Right, it's a very natural reaction. Yeah. There's, no, there's no shame in it. And number two is, you know, how can how can I stop that from happening in the future to myself, to my children, to my community, to my country, to my world, whatever it is. And even though that desire is completely understandable, I do. I'm wondering what your opinion on this might be, because I'm sort of sitting on the fence here, thinking, okay. If this insult movement is a new movement spawned by the social media, then surely there must be a new solution to it as well. And I'm torn between that and actually the superficial aspect is new, the social media, the Twitter, the, you know, this, the iPhone 13. But at the heart of this is something that we've never quite been able to shake off, which is people are violent, especially young men. And, uh, you know, it doesn't matter which what you want to throw at it, which ideology you'd like, 
there's going to be a recourse to violence. Of course, the, you know, this is nihilistic as well, you yeah, know. I think uh, the human love for violence is reflected in our popular culture. I mean, the last 10 years or so, the reemergence of horror films, for example, and violent music in, in heavy metal and everything like that, I think it's not something that we, that, that we are ever going to move away from. I think it's more about understanding and it and when you sort of relate the violence to the incel thing again it's sort of they, they talk in, in their own subreddits about women are often saying oh i want a bad boy and it's like well i'm i'm being a bad boy i'm giving them what they what they want and, and then that, that that that's not enough so you know it, it's almost it becomes i think they turn to violence as a last resort but is something that's never far away. They spend a lot of time on computers. They spend a lot of time online. You only need to turn on the TV at, at any time after nine o'clock, and the, you can find you can feed your violent. I don't know your, your your love for violence until six o'clock in the morning if of you course. want to. And I'm sure that's a concern for many parents, yeah, who, who might be seeing not only these horrific news reports, but the ease of access that their children uh, might be having. And and of course, you know, the question there is, you know, how do I stop my child from becoming, you know, inundated with these yeah. uh, with this ideology and, and doing violent, perhaps, uh, you know, committing uh, something they'll regret. And uh, this is as well a much broader and more, more difficult subject of, you know, how do you raise your, your children properly? It's also accepting that, that there is social media that exists out of the media's depiction that social media is Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Um, like extremist networks tend not to use those platforms because they've been banned and they've migrated to other things, Roblox servers, Minecraft servers, and they're things that the parents will quite happily let their 10-year-old kids sit on for three hours in their bedroom on their own. But there's been plenty of studies that say that Roblox servers and Discord servers have already been used for radicalization purposes by the far right, for example. How to get parents to teach kids how to use social media properly when there's aspects of social media that they don't even understand themselves and it's something yeah. that comes across in academia a lot is in terms of the the negative effects of the internet we need to educate people but i i always argue the question is well how do you educate a 30 year old man who's working his job running a family he hasn't got time to go to school to learn about how different social media works i remember the switch over from analog to digital tv and the, how long that took in Britain and trying to sort of have this conversation about actually social media isn't just Facebook. There is a whole other aspect that your kids use. They, they, they know how this works. We, we as adults and parents need to take some more responsibility and learn about how these platforms work. Absolutely. I, I agree with you. Although I would, I would add there as well, Matthew, and you know, I might be, I might be wrong here. You'd be the, uh, the expert judges as a father of, uh, of two, but, um, from my perspective, it's a big leap from a Minecraft server to a mass shooting. And I think a lot of things had to go wrong there. It wasn't just, you know, one day or two days. I mean, most likely it was a series of a lack of parenting that probably led to that, that outcome. Although again, I'm, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a clinical psychologist by any means, but but this is what I'm wondering as well. You know, how, how do you go from Minecraft server to, to mass shootings and where is the role of the parenting there and and how much can we attribute to to many people that have failed that children, not just the the radicalization agent, so to speak. Uh, and you know, that can be a, an imam at a mosque as much as it can be on a Minecraft server. But uh, surely that's that's just one piece in the puzzle that Many other things had to go wrong as well, and and is that being discussed when we talk about the insult movement? Is what were all the steps that were missing there? It followed the traditional radicalization pathway, and I don't think from the, the violent incidents that have been carried out, there has always been leakage. They don't ever tend to be something that is. is they don't tend to be spare of the moment things, um, which. Going back to the Jake Davison case, there's a lot, a lot of aspects of that that suggest that it was a spare of the moment thing. When you look back more at incel-related violence in the past, there's always been leakage before the use of manifestos and everything like that as well. Absolutely. 
the concept of female incels. Now, again, walking into this conversation, as I did with the limited knowledge that I had, you can imagine how much of a shock it was to me to be reading this. Female incels, okay, they're now entering public consciousness. And my question is, the female incels, is this also a reaction to a falling attractive, quote unquote, male population? Of course, how that's defined is is a mystery to me. But is this more of a social trend of younger generations placing much less value on relationships, Um, sex and families? I think from, from, I've done limited research into to female and cells. Um, from what I can gather that they appear to be older. There's definitely not the violent tendencies, but there is still the discussions about sexual market value. Um, what can I do to make myself more attractive? Um, and they share the same issues in terms of male and cells in which they feel that I do not meet the traditional picture of female beauty and I, I'm getting left behind because um, we, we, I'm not going to be a model. I'm not going to, to do that sort of things. But we're, I think recently, in the last sort of five to 10 years and social media and Instagram, I guess, are massive drivers of that. Is, there's a lot of pressure on body image for women and for men. Um, and I think the, the ease of online dating and the infinite sort of selection that it, puts in your head, it's it's very hard to to feel rejected if you invest a lot of time into those sorts of platforms and you don't get anywhere. So they they share similar aspects of the ideology and accept the move to violence. But then there's the other aspect that we are also starting to see now, which is the rise of the female baiting strategy, which is about manipulating men to buy them more drinks. Should you date a man who doesn't have a five-figure salary, for example? And that's something that it's almost the the answer to the extreme incel portion that does move to violence there is an aspect of female that is moving towards doing extreme manipulation as opposed to this as opposed to physical violence and it, it, it's, it's odd because the original concept of the involuntarily involuntarily separate movement was was a woman the um the original blog was posted online called the involuntary celibate project by an author referred to in literature as alana x in 1997 building off an idea that she originally had in 1993 and the uh, space in its formative years was very accepting and was an equal split between male and female but as time has progressed and we've seen the failure of pickup artists and a men going their own way movement radical men's rights activists have taken over the platform and sort of pushed females to the outskirts that they 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 still do exist but it's a predominantly male space but the issues that they discuss are very much the same it's there isn't i guess there isn't the malice and there's it's a more sort of Controlled despondence, I guess, is is the the, the way to to look at it. And right. the fact that they they know that they they don't fit the archetypal role of you will be a success. What can I do about it? And where the males sort of go, well, actually, if I'm just going to get left on and stood on, I'm going to make a stand, and sure. that's what causes the violence. There sure. doesn't seem to be the female drive to do that. And and perhaps, you know, we're talking about two sides of the same coin, essentially. Yeah. But perhaps because there is less recourse to violence, as you suggest, on the female side of the insult movement, it gets less of that glorious media attention. But that warps the public consciousness and narrative as well. I mean, to the extent that I've never heard of a female incel, and I had no idea that the uh, the originator, as you said, was was indeed a woman. So, uh, you know, if I'm a testament to anything, it's to the fact that as a society, we talk a lot about the incel movement, but we have yeah. very little actual understanding of it. And for me, I think that's that's a perfect analogy of I think one of one of the key issues that we're discussing when we discuss the insult movement, which is a breakdown of communication that are happening all over the place between the insults and the rest of society, between the rest of society and the insults, between the insults and the perpetrators, the victims, between everybody. There seems to me that one of the things that keeps popping up is this 
the breakdown of communication on the one hand, and then the disenfranchisement that it causes on the other hand. And, you know, so I think this is really interesting. On the other hand, with the female insults that you were mentioning just before, those pull and push factors of our modern world that lead youth into taking this this decision and to be, and, you know, becoming part of this this movement. I think those need to be taken a look at as well. I mean, surely a world in which we put more importance on material goods, yeah. gains, on on self, not selfishness necessarily, but the individual as the center of, of all all importance in life. I think some of the the factors that that might lead to is, is a world of void, uh, certainly for the for the insel movement, in which they feel, okay, you know, how do we negotiate? How do we move around a, a world of voids? Yeah, and um, and unfortunately some of those reactions might indeed end up being if the world is full of void and is meaningless and is full of self-serving yuppies and da 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 da, da you know i'm going to take extreme measures as a as a sort of as a sort of reaction to that and i wonder how much of that is explained on on the one hand by that that more violent side of, of the male side of the equation but then on the other hand as well you have, as you said, the quieter female incels, perhaps not so violent, uh, but that feel that they've answered that lack of being able to correlate with, with the modern world in, in their own way. I think even when, not just even in terms of the public, I think from the, the response of law enforcement to the Jake Davison um, incident as a whole, I think, yeah, the public there's a lack of understanding at public, but even more worrying for, for me is there's a lack of understanding at a law enforcement level. Yeah, and that leads to my next point, really, which is, you know, all of this lack of understanding and lack of communication surely can't be good uh, when yeah. we're talking about policy, because ultimately that's where this discussion has to go, which is, you know, we identify a problem, uh, we identify the risks. Now, how do we identify uh, the remedy, the solution to that? And I can sort of preempt uh, your answer here, which is unfortunately not good, but let me ask it to you anyway, Matthew, right. which is, you know, what kind of policy at the national level can we sort of envisage here of being able to address at least partly to remedy uh, the more, especially the more extreme lashings of the insult movement? And would you, would you say that de-radicalization programs like PREVENT might be effective. I always struggle with the radicalization as as a term because I don't think it's something that we can quantify yet. Um, in terms of the exit process for a lot of programs, it, it's very much of you have nothing to go on apart from what the perpetrator is telling you. So I worry. And in terms of prevent and its effectiveness in terms of incel, because pre prevent works almost in the pre-crime space, almost throughout the radicalization process, I think with incels, committing to that ideology is so quick that the radicalization process in terms of where prevent can make um, an interruption to the process, there isn't very much time for it to happen. Um, something that I would sort of like to see and something that I would like to have seen, especially in Plymouth with the kids going back to school post Jake Davidson is where in schools we have um, careers guidance teachers, that type of thing. Is it about time that um, school districts and councils had prevent officers going into the schools, having these discussions about how to use social media properly, what these different extremisms are, passing these abilities on to nurses, teachers, and in terms of the education process, we can, we're risking the relationships between teachers and students because students will not tell the teacher something because they don't want a prevent referral. I think somebody coming in and almost having a regional prevent officer to stay on top of what is happening in terms of extremism, because it can change every day. And the only thing that you're going to achieve by giving people out of date information or not the right information is making the problem worse. So that's something that I'd like to see more of the government doing is putting things in place to catch kids at that formative years from 13, 14 to 15, where they, yeah. they're getting more sexually aware, they're growing up, they're making sure. that change. Um, social media is becoming a lot bigger thing in their life. 
we've done it for 30 years, go in and speak to children about what their career is, whether they should go to university. Why are we not now going, okay, we have various forms of extremism. We've got the far right, we've got Islamic, we've got mixed ideologies now under prevent as well. Well, how how do we deal with something as a, as a mixed ideology? We can't, we can't address a problem if that's what it's called. And I think what adds further complexity to the situation is that we're dealing with two highly complicated things. The first is social media yeah. and second is youth. <laughs> and I think at least it, when it comes to both of them, I have, I have no idea, but let's, let's try and, and dissect here for a second, what either of these two spheres might mean on the social media side. I tend to view it as a bit of a wild west where fake news is something we are aware of. It's, yeah. it, it is having real consequences not only just fake news, but also disinformation. And as well, we have the company's profit. We had a lot of discussion over lockdown, especially about how uh, Facebook in particular, it, for example, has it's been altering its algorithm based on what it thinks you might find uh, you know, attractive enough to stay on the site for just a click longer that you know, the next advertisement comes in, right? So, so in between all of that, there is a, there's an important profit motive for these social media companies. And it's important not to forget that because I do think that is it fuels into the picture here as well. If, especially if we're going to be talking about a solution and how do you navigate around social media? It's not so easy uh, when you have algorithm geniuses who've worked out how to make you stay for longer and they don't you know, necessarily care that your child is uh, reading something that's true that's never been what it's about. Anyway, so that's on the one hand. On the other hand, youth, what makes me think how complicated this is, is that, you know, when we're talking about youth, you may have some young people who might, for lack of a better term, dabble, all right, dabble in the uh, insult ideology and web pages and groups and, you know, hashtags and whatever it is. But there might not be any real danger. It might just be part of the learning process of being a rebellious teenager, of thinking you've got the answer to everything, of trying to be controversial for the sake of it, of whatever it is. And then by the time that these children get to university, you know, they start getting into other things and, you know, real life happens and you grow out of it, right? Um, I think that's the case for, for most young people, I should hope. Yes. Of course, the problem is that some, even from you know, families where, you know, the parents took a very active role and they went to school and et cetera, et cetera, they might get lost in it. The dabble might become getting lost in the ideology. And, and you know, these are, of course, the cases that we must be looking at. But I guess my, my question, Matthew, is in as far as the youth goes, you know, how do you separate the two? Is it possible? And how can we tell apart the stopping for a visit as opposed to this child is really at danger of getting lost in the, in the movement. I don't know if I've got the answer for that, and it's increasingly difficult because we know how inquisitive young minds are. Um, they, they may, for example, an algorithm on autoplay on YouTube, for example, people could get sucked in by the content and not be sucked in by the message. Really, really difficult one. I think that more needs to be done in, in terms of social media, but I think more needs parents and education establishments maybe need to take more responsibility in teaching people how to use the internet as, as for what it is. I think it, it's been, it's come out into the public and we've never really been shown how to use it properly. And I think there is a period of education needed for everybody, I think. Of course. And it's changing so quickly. You know, so yeah. just what social media is, is changing. YouTube is changing very quickly. Um, you know, the, the, the whole concept of the, uh, of the content creator, and this is increasingly how young people in the West, in the UK, are consuming media and the role figures that they're looking up to and, and the social media that they're using. And, you know, this goes back to the Wild West that I was mentioning before, yeah. because these content creators, who knows what they'll come up with, ever increasing, ever rapidly evolving strategies to capture the attention of young people. They, they almost become almost godlike to their subs subscribers. And I'm wondering how much of that content 
might have, if not necessarily blatant examples of incel ideology, but little ones, a little misogynistic comment here and there, a little blaming of, of other people for you, but, you know, whatever it is, little yeah. bits of, uh, you know, little tracks that they leave behind, which lead young people into, yeah. you know, taking further steps and, and mm-hmm. digging into, you know, I wonder how much that's a part of it and how do you regulate that? I don't know. I think it's very dangerous anyway. I think this comes back to when we were talking about things like when you go looking for statistics in terms of male suicide, for example, doing a Google search on, on that sort of thing, you have to be very sure what you hit on that first page of Google because there is twisted versions of every, everything that you want to find. And it, there's a responsibility on, on you as a user, I guess, to make an informed choice. And we're not giving people the tools to make an informed choice, I think is a problem. It's interesting, Matthew, because I remember growing up as high-speed internet became a thing for a lot of us. The promise that it held was, yeah. it was like, <laughs> you know, you went from having a whatever, in, in my case, when I was much younger, uh, t- television, right? Just the, the telly, that's what we had, to all of a sudden, you know, you had stuff like Google or Ask Jeeves or whatever it was back in the day, the possibilities of the internet were limitless. And now in this conversation with you today, you know, the words that I'm writing down here, danger everywhere. Yeah. It's kind of strange because I I grew up at the same time as you and I remember that the celebrities and the hassle they used to get from the paparazzi and we still talk about that now. And then we, we take off our traditional media glasses and put our social media glasses on and it's, it's just, people are posting on social media so they essentially get the paparazzi following them around <laughs> and then we of course celebrate that but by our young people who then aspire to have all the followers and to do that you need to fit the mold and that then all feeds into well i don't fit the mold well i've got a story that i'm like that as well and how far down the rabbit hole do you want to go It's like a fragmentation, right? And on the one hand, you think, great, you know, all this new representation for, you know, niche uh, interests and da-da-da-da-da. And that's great on the one hand. And then on the other hand, there's such a failing towards young people that we that we have as a society in being able to to step in when this content that they find online leads them uh, down very dark, uh, twisted pathways. And I think that's that's the tragedy of it all, isn't it? It's not necessarily social media, but rather the failings of social media that play a large part in um, in the unrestrained aspects of, of the insult movement and the worst cases coming out of it. Which leads me to my next point, Matthew. Of course, the, a lot of the focus that we have, the reason that I wanted to sit down with you today, of course, coming into this conversation is, okay, there's this insult movement. We've heard on the news how there's people dead. How do we stop the insult movement as if it's a bad thing? But I'm wondering, after a conversation today, seeing that, yes, there's dangers there, like, like in anything, but is it necessarily all a rotten structure? Or do you think in a way that there's, there's anything in the insult movement that can be rescued there, or that is at least not dangerous and understandable? I think there are, there are aspects of there that we need to look at without our violence associated, associated lenses on. Because across most forms, of it, people turn to extremism because they feel like they're being left behind socially, or they're feeling like they're being isolated. Well, th- th- this has been going on for years and people are still isolated. And I think if there's one thing that, one positive aspect that we can take from the incel is Right, we know that this is a problem now. There is plenty of people talking about it, and we know what happened. If we leave these people to just deal with it amongst themselves, what what we need to do as practitioners or rehabilitators, or even as the public, is sort of become more aware of of the signs if somebody is sort of withdrawing from society. If they are sort of starting to talk about political aspects or ideologies that aren't reflective of the norms, then we need to question them and we need to challenge them. But in order to do that probably, we need to, to, to reframe what, what the push and pull factors towards extremism is. And not everyone that is an extremist is poorly educated or from a poor background. Some of them are highly educated and it's the, the 
the problems in the higher levels of structure and government and policy that draw to extremism. I think everybody can be vulnerable to it. It's not just the lower echelons of society. And I think that's something that we can take from the incel movement is actually, I, I, I'm, I'm a male, I would hold my life as fairly successful, but I can still identify with various things that they say. I mean, this conversation that we've had just now has been very mind-opening for me because I very much came with the, you know, just whatever I was handed down from the, the larger social cues at work about what the insult movement is. And through speaking with you today, I've now come to appreciate how it's a lot more complicated. And there's a lot of social failings that are fueling this movement. There's a lot of concerns that the insult movement is raising that actually I think are in some ways, if not necessarily legitimate, but I do understand why they're taking yeah. place. And I do think, you know, this is very much a reactionary movement. If you see people talking in the online spaces about the issues that are relevant to you, and we'll just use Jordan Peterson as an example, when you see the public reaction that he's getting, the hatred that he gets, you know, it, it, it forces you even more into that corner. You're not going to go and have these conversations if, if highly regarded intellectual people are uh, just getting told no, that they're wrong and that they're misogynistic. And somebody who is already lacking in self-confidence and a lack of self-worth, you're just going to internalise those. So. And I think there, there's general truth that if you're, if you're not able to have a discussion where you you don't necessarily agree with the person saying, standing next to you, but you do give them a space and you do at least yeah. give them an opportunity to... If you can't do that, then the problem gets only worse because the, the viewpoints are going to be cemented without any kind of... It's like an echo chamber without any kind of chance of a middle ground being reached. And I think that's not just a problem of the insult movement, but is a problem that I see happening across many different areas of life, uh, not just terrorism, but the left-right divide generally in the world today. And I think the basis of that actually is, as you suggest, that there's a high moral ground intellectual elite that decides that this is the viewpoint that is politically correct and it's the only truth and if you're outside of that you're wrong and you won't have a platform and you're dangerous you should just go and change your views or just disappear or something or even worse is the viewpoint that all incels are they're all loonies they have nothing valuable to add they're completely misguided and they have nothing worthwhile to say and again i'm wondering you know does that just make the problem uh, the divide worse it's one of my personal worries when I conduct research for myself. From like I said before, I'm this may be a research area that I'm looking for my PhD, and it's being very aware because I don't want to sort of come across as as an advocate for incel because what they do is abhorrent and it's wrong. But there are aspects of what they discuss that are relevant, and the focus on the violence and the wrong thing is is doing a disservice to the actual driving issues. And it's trying to, I, I find as a male, trying to discuss incel and sort of say, well, actually, I agree with some parts of it. I, I know that by saying that, I open myself up to this sort of abuse. Well, how can you side with them? And I'm like, well, I'm not siding with them. I'm not saying what they think is right. I'm not saying that their ideology is right. But what I am saying is I can appreciate the fact that they are feeling rejected and let down and trodden on. Because as a male, I, I can see it as well, you know? Mm. I think for me, fundamentally, you know, my interest in this, like my interest in, in most things in life, has to do with understanding something. Yeah. You know, that's something that I've always wanted to to strive for is I'm not so much a person that uh, has an interest in casting uh, moral judgments. Uh, it's just not in my blood. Unfortunately, social media is not the same. No, I guess, well, <laughs> I mean, I understand why, you know, the, the, the push factor and, the, you know, the feel good factor, but yeah. I guess I, I'm just more built up with a sociological mindset. I I intensely enjoy studying the crazy little things that humans do. I, I find human life is fascinating and from my own perspective. So I do understand as well where you're coming from. I find the conversation that we had today mind-opening and truly interesting. And it's not about 
judging or uh, coming down with a hammer and and cursing and setting aside and labeling and whatever it is. There's plenty of people who can do that. I think the more interesting thing that we were able to achieve in our conversation today is taking a look at what this is, this this so-called insole movement, being able to study it from all the different angles, where it came from, what it does, how it's shaped, uh, who are the members that populate it, how were they populated, how were they routed, how are they derouted. That's a different kind of angle, yeah. and it's a more studious, it's more academic kind of angle. And I believe that it, if there's any hope of as a society, being able to tame this movement, or at the very least, being able to stop its wildest excesses, it has to do with being able to understand a problem truthfully and clearly. And the only way to do that is if we de-ideologize, if I can invent yeah. the word, the conversation. You know, So it's not so much about, as you say, taking sides, but rather it's about how do we get to the bottom of it? Yeah, it's, it's a conversation that needs to be had where you almost um, disassociate the characters from what you're talking about and, and and agendas and everything like that and actually break it down and talk about the real issues. I think that because gender is such a touchy subject at the moment, just in general, it's very easy in there to turn around. Yes. It, it's it's yeah. a male-only problem and, and it's all bad, but it, it, it really isn't. And I think... Um, as, you, as we spoke about earlier on, the, the arrival in the public conscience of, oh, actually, there, there, are, there, is, there are females that subscribe to this as well. It just adds another layer of uh, complexity to it all. Hopefully. And it's truly, it's a fascinating topic, Matthew, yeah. and not only just for your PhD, which which I wish you the best in, but also just generally. I mean, I think this is very much a 21st century topic. It touches, as you said earlier on during our conversation, it holds up a mirror to society and it touches on so many different aspects of, of life in, in 21st century Western world, perhaps the global world. And I think that this is really where it's at, because if we can get to the bottom of this, then I think we're getting to the ball. I think half the problem with, with when you look at Intel is when we talk about things like Islamist extremism or the far far right, etc. it's very easy for us to point and sort of say it's, it's them. There are aspects of the Intel message and ideology, their belief system that are present in us as Western people. And it's forcing us to turn around and look at ourselves. And we haven't really had to do that very, very, because we've always been able to say, no, it's narcissism or no, it's Islamic, Islamist extremism. It's, it's, it's something else. It's not a problem of the West's doing. Well, in self for me, shares a lot more similarities with Western culture than, ev- than everything else. Not only that, it's presenting us with something that for a lot of people, we thought we would cast away. Yeah. You know, misogyny. It reminds us of the darkest days of medieval history or whatever. And there's many of us, myself included, who cannot wait to see the day when we're over this bridge or we can all treat each other respectfully. But we're not there yet. We're not by a long shot in so many ways. It's almost like it brings forward these uncomfortable truths that yeah. we have to deal with these these divides in society. We like to think that the working boys man club is a thing of the 20th century. And unfortunately, whilst they seem to have disappeared a little bit from the public conscious, they, they do still exist. And we have plenty of, for example, male dominated factory work, for example. And, and you know, that, that, the, the misogynistic views of what people found funny in 1970 and stuff. People have been working in these factories for 30 years. They haven't disappeared. It's nothing about them so much anymore. Where this is taking place is social media yeah. and the youth. It's not in a factory making hammers. A modern twist to it all, isn't there? You could argue that, but in terms of internal perpetrators, there are a lot that are, well, not a lot, but there are some that are, uh, late 30s, early 40s, and they do have that sort of 15, 20 years of experience in the workplace that the people that are carrying out aren't, aren't always young college kids straight from school or straight from uni. There, there are some that have experiences of working. So just to assume that it would be a young person's issue, I think it 
is also a bit unfair because there is plenty of evidence that suggests that this is something that is relevant to old, old, the older generations as well. And when you look back to man's club culture that was so prevalent in 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, and relating to the Jake Davidson incident with where he works, people work in there and worked in there for 30, 40 years. And those predominantly male spaces where that misogyny that was so evident then is still there. It's just not talked about. And now we'd add to that, that the transmission that's taking place there mm. between that older, perhaps, uh, mindset of the yeah. uh, the traditional misogyny towards a new generation, that transmission is taking place over social media. Yeah. But then there's the other factor as well of the social media that compounds the effect. It doubles it because you have the echo chamber and you have the, the Reddit forums or yeah. whatever it is that just make what would before would have been at least a visible transmission into an anonymous silent and potentially very quickly radicalizing and the worst uh, things that come out of yeah. that it's all happening sort of under a blind eye those predominantly male spaces are can be held up as a driving factor if you are not the archetypal good-looking guy and you're going into work every monday and all of your colleagues are talking about all their sexual exploits over the weekend and you do not have that why am I not doing this? And this is, gonna, this is what then what drives you onto the social media echo chambers. So it, it, it's a tough one. It can get you. It can get you in both spaces. It can get you in yeah. the real world space and in the in the online world. Yeah. And I think we're not we are almost not talking about its effects in the real world. We, 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 we're saying it's a lot. It's driven a lot by online, and I think that's something that we're applying to extremism in general. That. Absolutely. The online space has driven radicalization beyond anybody's wildest dreams, but there is still things that take place in our real world, working day-to-day lives that, that can drive people towards these ideologies as well. Of course. It's a complex mix of factors, Matthew. Yeah. I think that's uh, in the short summary of of a conversation running over an hour here is that it is a complex subject. and And I think there's a lot of ignorance. And so this is why it's so important for us to be sat here today talking about it. And of course, uh, for you to continue your work studying this, doing a a PhD and doing this again, to be able to spread the word and to be able to talk about it more, because that must be a part of the solution, at least in uh, in reducing that ignorance. The thing with this ideology and the immediate threat perception within the public is the, the perpetrators look like me and you. They look like us. Usually, if it was somebody from the far right, we'd go, you know, he, he fits the stereotypical of a, a Nazi skinhead, for example. Sure. Uh, yeah, right. If, if we're following, if somebody's a, a Muslim and he is, you can tell he's a as Muslim, you can t- just tell, right? If this one, you're saying, this could, this could be anyone. This could be you're, you're the person that you work next to at school. You, would, you wouldn't know. And that's, that's why it's so scary. The, the, the lone wolf nature of the attacks, the fact that it, it could be the person next door to us. They don't have to be a refugee. They don't have to experience, they don't have to experience conflicts being a victim of somewhere else. This is something that is affecting me and you. And as they say, you know, there's a, there's an older aspect of this, but the newer aspect, the movement aspect of it, that's something the world is going to have to contend with. Yeah. And we're not looking at manifesto. We're not looking at stated outcomes. We're not looking at a nation state wanting to be formed. It's not any kind of traditional sort of a violent movement that we've had before. Again, this fuels the complexity of, of the issue that we're talking about, the insult movement. And I think we've done a great job, Matthew, of, uh, in, in the hour and a half here that, um, of, of discussing these complexities. But starting to round off our discussion here for a second, I wanted to just briefly mention for my last bit here, one of the things you had mentioned earlier during our discussion, which has to do with when you're talking about the insult movement and how it's reacting to these different push and pull factors taking place. Immediately, I was thinking in an earlier podcast, I was discussing the subject of the liberal state and how it always seems to be at at war with somebody or something. And this is specifically relating to the United States sort of foreign policy. And we were speaking about the Iraq war and the Afghanistan war and all the other wars before and after that. And one of the ideas that that was thrown in that discussion was this idea of the, the liberal machine creating its own periphery. 
that it then feels a missionary zeal to go and conquer. So the idea of Ouroboros comes to mind. So sort of it's an ancient symbol of a snake eating its own tail. And I want to bring that sort of into the discussion here today by making that analogy of saying, you know, can we also view this, the insult movement, its beginnings, its, its ends, its all of it, as something that happens on the outskirts of the neoliberal order? How do you place the two? I would place um, the incel movement subculture directly as a result of the neoliberalist approach in government recently with the whole sort of, if you want something, go learn, invest, buy the books, train, educate yourself. Once you've done that, you can go and get it. It's yours. Go on and rule the world. The world doesn't work like that. There, there, there's 10 people doing exactly the same thing that you're doing. Um, but we continue to push this. If you do what we tell you and do all the right steps, you will get to the end goal. What we're seeing now is actually people are doing this. They're doing all the steps that they're taking and they're not getting those end goals. And they're going then, well, I've done everything that you told me now and I'm being left behind. What what do I do? Well, again, the cycle then again, it just starts again, doesn't it? So, well, maybe if you tried to change your diet, let's do that. And we start that cycle. Well, now I've changed my diet and my, my sex life still hasn't got any better. So how, how do I go from that? And I think that in terms of relating that back to incel, it works very well with the pickup artist sort of scene that was on VH1 and MTV at the turn of the 21st century, where, oh, if you can't get a girlfriend, um, it, the, the early form of the self-help guru that, that we're seeing now, it's like, if you can't get a girlfriend, buy this book talk to them like this wear a purple hat etc etc and when those things don't work people are going right now what do i do i've bought into your rhetoric of everything that was going to make things better and it's not and now i'm hitting the wall and i'm frustrated and that is what's fueling the turn to to at least the aggression or getting involved in discussions or ideologies that that can be and in, in, and in dangerous real world events, to be honest. Sure. The powerlessness and uh, yeah. the feeling of, oh, I've done everything you've asked me to. Why am I still broke, fat, unhappy, middle-aged? Yeah. <laughs> we had it at high school. Everybody was like, oh, you need to go and get a degree, you know, in this process of, as obviously a bit older. But it's like, I've finished my honours degree in it. So actually now that's not good enough because we've told everybody that you need, you need to go and get an honours degree to be considered right to now. It's, I've got to go and get a master's and it's like well what if that's not good enough <laughs> what do I do after that and I think we're not we're not picking up the people that are falling by the wayside I think we see eye to eye on this the vastness and the complexities and the difficulty that fuels into this movement. And there's not any one thing you can latch on to. A mass marketing society, to a lack of social media regulation, to parenting, and to a million other things in between that we've talked about today. We've been doing a pretty good job of uh, sort of dissecting how it all comes together. But where does it go from here? Do you see signs that we are beginning to understand and tackle and have a good chance of stopping the, the wildest excesses, the news headlines or what the mass shootings? Or do you think, actually, we're not getting this at all? I think we're at the, at the risk of making things worse before they get better. We've raised awareness of an issue that we don't understand. And when people have discussions about things that they don't understand fully and completely, that doesn't tend to have any benefit. It only tends to make the situation worse. And I think that that's that's where we are at the moment. I think things are starting to change, but it's going to be a very, very, very slow process because it, it doesn't fit the media framing and turning things like framing and government policy and stuff. That that takes a lot of time, and in that that period of time, whilst things may be changing, an example for would be getting the online harms white paper of government has taken nearly two years. Um, in that time, I think the frequency of this type of incident, I think it will increase, unfortunately, before it gets better, before mm. we start to see any sort of reduction. Well, it's more useful to finish on an accurate note. And for that, Matthew, I want to thank you for the conversation that we've had today. I know these are 
difficult issues. They're not always happy, giddy, sunny things we're dealing with. A complicated, confusing, disorienting movement here that's affecting many people today. So these things can be challenging, but I wanted to thank you more than anything for helping me through my ignorance on the subject. So I, I am thankful for that. It's been a nice opportunity, really. I've had conversations in university about it in terms of coursework that I did for my master's, and you always seem to get the same sort of, no, it is, it's the lonely man in the corner, and um, no, there's a lot more to it than that, and if we are going to refer to them as the lonely man in the corner, all we're going to do is make it worse. So getting the opportunity to talk about it and say that, hey, it's about more than what the newspapers are telling us, these conversations need to be had. Thank you so much for joining us at MI Cynic. Hopefully we'll be talking again soon. And I hope you'll stay with us for the next episodes that we've got planned. Please remember to follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, and more. And of course, to check out our website for the latest episodes. Thank you so much and have a great day.